Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. John Sperling from the Mayo Clinic, United States. Dr. Sperling is a professor of orthopedic surgery at the Mayo Clinic and Mayo Medical School at Rochester, Minnesota. After completing his residency at the Mayo Clinic in 1999, Dr. Sperling pursued his sports and shoulder surgery fellowship at the Hospital for Special Surgery. Subsequently, he joined the Mayo Clinic as assistant professor 2000, and since 2008, he's full professor of orthopedic surgery at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Sperling is a recipient of several awards, some of which include the Walter Reed Award from the University of Virginia, the Charles Neer Award, and the Mark Coventry Award. He has served as chair of the American Academy's Shoulder and Elbow Subcommittee and serves in several positions at the American Shoulder and Elbow Society. Dr. Sperling is a reviewer for the more than 15 high impact journals and serves as sections editor for several of the Academy's pub publications. He's been the co-course director for the Mayo Clinic Shoulder Arthroscopy course since 2005. Dr. Spurling has over 280 publications in high impact shoulder surgery journals and has contributed over 55 book chapters in prestigious textbooks. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Professor John Spurling from the Mayo Clinic. Over to you, Professor. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to participate today. I'll be speaking about reverse shoulder arthroplasty from primary to revision. This is my disclosure. And the reverse arthroplasty was first approved by the FDA in 2004. And the concept behind this is to have a convex glenoid and a concave humerus and this increases the lever arm of the deltoid to compensate for a deficient rotator cuff, as you can see in this schematic here on the right. And there has been dramatic growth of the reverse arthroplasty worldwide, and it represents greater than 50% of all shoulder replacements done. And it's utilized for a breadth of primary indications, and the ingrowth base plate with screw fixation has really transformed revision shoulder arthroplasty. So this is the typical patient we think about on the primary setting for reverse arthroplasty. We can see there's end-stage arthritis as well as superior subluxation of the humeral head, indicating that the rotator cuff in this patient is deficient. CT scans have become a normal part of practice for many of us. CT scans help us understand the version of the glenoid, the amount of the wear, as well as the osteophytes on the glenoid, understanding when we perform the procedure that we understand where the vault is and we're not fooled by anterior or posterior osteophytes off the glenoid. And the CT scan really does help us to determine the entry point and the amount of reaming that we do on the glenoid to get it to a neutral base plate. How about positioning? So one key tip that I think is making sure from the start of the procedure, the patient is positioned appropriately. And you can see here in this example that the medial border of the scapula is free. We have a rolled up towel under there, and that way we can adduct the arm to the side and get a direct shot from the humerus from above. The incision itself, I like an incision on the front of the shoulder that's extensile. Typically we start this all the way up at the clavicle and extend it distally for 12 to 15 centimeters. And it usually passes about a half centimeter lateral to the coracoid, as you can see in this example. The easiest way to find the delta pectoral interval is go north. There's typically a small triangle of fat that's present between the deltoid and the pectoralis. And what we do is we cauterize on that, put a band retractor in there, and leave the cephalic vein medially. Inferior capsular release is really essential. We want to be able to stay on bone. We want to visualize the capsule as we release this. And the safest way to do this is with the arm externally rotated and adducted and we release the capsule back to the four o'clock position. So you can see here is an example of the generous inferior capsule release. And when we make the entry hole in the humerus, we want a generous entry hole. We don't want the entry hole itself to dictate where the stem goes. We want the canal. So I use a large burr to make the entry hole. Then we use an ice pick to make sure that we're central within the canal. And then we'll use the circular reams. And thankfully, the rate of isolated humeral loosening is almost non-existent. So we do not need to aggressively twist our hand around with these reamers. We simply use these as a sound to feel the cortical bone. Once we engage cortical bone, we can stop with that. 
Then we'll go ahead and cut the humerus. I do like to use instrumentation. I think this does make it more reproducible. And I tend to be a simple person. So hemi, total reverse. I cut the humerus in 30 degrees of retroversion. There's a bar down the forearm. And this keeps the operation simple and reproducible. We'll go ahead and place a brooch in there. And then one of the challenges that many surgeons have is glenoid exposure. So for me, the keys for glenoid exposure, and if I'm having a difficult time with it, it's usually due to one of these four reasons. Lack of deltoid mobilization, insufficient capsule release, too high a head cut, or insufficient osteophyte removal. So if you're having a hard time seeing the glenoid, go back to these four steps. These will help you significantly. So here's a typical case example. This is a patient who we're doing a reverse arthroplasty on who's got a massive rotator cuff tear without arthritis. So what we're gonna do in this case here, we're gonna ream the glenoid, the bottom 50% of the glenoid you can see on the example on the right. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use an augment to help create the tilt. What we've learned over time is we have to avoid superior tilt of the glenoid. So to get that glenoid position back to neutral or inferior tilt, we're gonna be able to use an augment for that. So what we'll do in this case, we'll drill an alignment post hole, as you can see in the center. And on the right, you can see the hole there. And that will allow us to prepare and place the augment in the identical rotation. So what we'll do then is to put a guide on there that's flush with the bone. We'll tighten the screw down to make sure that's flush. And then we'll just touch and ream the superior part of the glenoid. And you can see there we've preserved that nice hard cortical bone. And we'll place the augment in there. And you can see on the right how the augment helps create the tilt. Rather than reaming away excessive central and inferior glenoid bone, we're using the augment itself to help create the tilt. Then we'll be able to fix this down with the center screw. One of the other nice features we have now is the ability to titrate the glenosphere. In the past, we used to max out the glenosphere, dial it way below the glenoid base plate to prevent notching. But what we've learned over time is we only need a few millimeters of the glenosphere below the bottom part of the base plate to prevent notching. So in this case, we'll go ahead and place the glenosphere down there. And there's a typical post-operative example. So you can see here, rather than reaming away central and inferior bone, we've used the augment itself to create the tilt. The other nice thing is we get longer central and peripheral screws, as you can see on the axillary view there, with fixation and preservation of glenoid bone. One of the other nice things we have now are offset trays. So here's an example in a small woman. She's got a massive cuff tear with the inability to raise the arm. We place the augment in superiorly, and on the view on the right, you can see that's an offset tray. So it covers the humerus in a better manner. It slightly medializes the humerus, allowing us to resect less humeral bone in a tight shoulder in a smaller patient. Here's another example of superior wear. And this is one in the past. We used to ream away all that central and inferior bone. You can see in this example, using a medium augment, how we're able to use the augment to make up for the missing bone. And again, that offset tray covers the humerus now in a better manner compared to a central tray. So the reverse has a number of different indications. This is an example of one with post-traumatic arthritis. This is a patient who underwent ORIF with a plate and screw fixation and different ways to solve problems. So in the past, probably what we would have done is gone ahead and taken out this whole plate and screws, but there's other ways to manage this. In this case, what we did is we actually just removed the top screws and then placed a little short stem in there and this allows us to avoid stripping that whole deltoid insertion, removing the entire plate and screws. Here's another example. This is a patient who underwent a total elbow arthroplasty. And you can see the cement in this case was extruded all the way up the humeral canal. And this is one where in the past we would have had to use an ultra drive or other devices to have to remove the cement. But in this case, the way we'll manage this is to use a little short stem instead. So you can see that's exactly what we've done now. We've actually switched to using these little short micro stems on all my primary cases now, realizing again, the rate of isolated humeral loosening is very rare. How about accurate position? I think what we've met, learned over time is that outliers matter. 
and we want to place our components in the center of the bell-shaped curve and avoid these outliers. So here's an example of an outlier. So if you look on the left there, that's the way the base plate should be. We can see that base plate in there that faces across from the glenoid. Now take a look on the right. This was a patient that was sent to me and unfortunately the surgeon got lost at the time of surgery and placed the glenoid base plate 90 degrees in the wrong direction. So you can see how people can get lost and make these errors and we really want to avoid this problem. So computer assisted surgery, I think, is resulting in rapid advances in 3D planning and modeling. And it allows the surgeon to virtually perform and plan the surgery before entering the operating room. And I think 3D printing a guide, a custom guide for that patient's anatomy is another step that we're doing now in shoulder surgery that is helping significantly. So here's a complex case. You can see this is a patient who had a history of post-traumatic arthritis, patient subsequently developed avascular necrosis. And if you look on the view on the right, what's happened now, this patient has developed what we call a fish mouth deformity. The humeral head is frankly collapsed and now is eroded away the glenoid. So in this patient, you can see that the significant deformity that's present, and we see that in the CT scan here. So this is what it looks like at the time of sore surgery. You can see that fish mouth deformity, the entire humeral head now is collapsed. And we made a custom guide for this place patient. We plan this case, and that's what the glenoid looked like at the time of surgery. And then once again, having these 3D models at the time of surgery is very helpful. It gives us a better appreciation of the anatomy and it improves the precision in how we can prepare and place the glenoid component. So there's an example of the guide on the bone. And this is an example of a prior generation guide. And this one, we can place a superior pin for an anatomic and the reverse, we do want some inferior tilt. So we're gonna place the pin in this patient through the bottom hole right into the glenoid surface, as you can see here. We'll go ahead and place the base plate in there. And there's again, using a little short stem to be able to manage a complex problem. So for me, I like to think about how can I transform a complex problem into something more simple and straightforward. So here's an example of a patient that uh, was sent to me with a massive rotator cuff tear. You can see typical rotator cuff arthropathy in this case. And this is a patient that we're going to go ahead and do a reverse arthroplasty on. So there's the axillary view. You can see there's wear of the glenoid surface. You can see the superior erosion on the glenoid itself. So what we'll do is take the CT scan and then we're gonna plan it. So this is importing it into software. We can see this patient has six degrees of native retroversion. And what we're also going to highlight in this case is the benefit of using augments to preserve bone. So we're going to plant it first with a regular mini base plate. And you can see how much bone we have to ream away centrally and inferiorly to get that glenoid base plate back to neutral tilt. We know there's approximately 21 degrees of superior part tilt from the inferior part of the glenoid. We have to get that back to neutral. And this is how we used to do it. Now we're going to put a mini base plate in there and we can see that we can preserve bone. Putting that augment superior can really help. Now we're gonna go ahead and be able to plan that case further. We can decide on the length of screws. We're gonna go ahead and look for a medium augment in this patient. This is a 20 degree augment to be able to help preserve further bone. And we can really focus in on the anatomy. We can see how much medial lateral translation we save with the augment and then we'll be able to go ahead and once we get in the operating room, try to execute our plan. So this patient we bring to the operating room and here's what the guide looks like for us. And this is a cool feature I'll show you. It has depth control reaming. There's one pin for the central part and the superior pin is gonna control our depth. And that's the guy that snaps on the reamer to again, control the depth of the ream. So here's the delta petrol approach, typically a 12 to 15 centimeter incision right on the shoulder itself. We'll go ahead and go medially as I talked about. We'll look for that triangle of fat between the deltoid and pec, one centimeter medial to the coracoid. Once we identify that, we're set to go. We'll make that generous entry hole in the humerus that we talked about. And then we'll go ahead with this, place the ice pick in there to feel the center of the canal. And again, we use these little reamers as a sound. Once I engage cortex, I stop. I like to cut the humerus in 30 degrees of retroversion, as I mentioned. Hemi total reverse, keep it simple. We'll go ahead, we'll cut the humeral head. 
I like to do that release off the posterior part of the humerus, release the capsule there, that helps. I like to sit the patient straight up and down. I think it helps my visualization of the glenoid. And then different retractors you can use at the time of surgery. There's a variety of ones. I do like the one on the far left that's a glenoid access retractor. And what we'll do is we have that glenoid access retractor in posteriorly, a bent home in superiorly, and that knee retractor will swap out anteriorly for a Batman retractor. And there's the visualization of the glenoid. We'll put the pin in on the bottom there. That's going to give us our inclination and tilt. We'll put a superior pin in there, and that's going to help us with our depth control. And we'll be able to see that matches what we planned. And here's the reamer with depth control. So this will stop us when we get to the exact depth that we want. We've learned this can preserve quite a bit of glenoid bone. One or two millimeters of reaming of the glenoid, if you can save that, you can save 40 to 50% glenoid bone. We can see there with the circular augment, we're going to dial this to the exact rotation that we want in the glenoid surface. So that's the benefit of having a circular augment. We'll go ahead, we'll pull the pin, and now we're going to put the guide on there to ream the glenoid further. We'll go ahead and place a screw on there. We'll make sure the guide now is flush down with the bone surface. Then we'll go ahead and place a black cap on there and then we'll place the reamer on there to be able to go ahead and ream the bone. So this has all been planned preoperatively to preserve the maximum amount of glenoid bone. We planned this for a medium augment. We're now going to go ahead and execute this for a medium augment. You can see we've preserved that nice hard cortical bone superiorly there. And there's that medium augment. We've dialed this to the exact rotation we wanted. And look at the compression we get with the center screw. So once that goes down, we can see the compression we get with that. So many surgeons like myself love to use a center screw because of that compression. I think the compression you get with that is much better than you would with the post. We can see the whole scapula moving together with the base plate, showing that we have absolute fixation. We'll place the peripheral screws, and then we'll place our glenosphere. And again, we only need now to dial the glenosphere down a few millimeters to prevent notching. We'll go ahead and tape, tap down the base plate and, excuse me, the glenosphere, as you can see here. Then on the humeral side, these are these offset trays. This is a standard tray. If you can see it doesn't cover the humerus quite right. Here's a plus three offset tray. We start to get a little better coverage of the humerus. And then a plus six offset tray really covers the humerus in a better manner. The next thing we're going to show is what does that imply for range of motion? So here's the standard tray. We'll go ahead, we'll reduce the shoulder. And with this, we'll probably get maybe 100 degrees of elevation. And then you get impingement between the acromion and the tuberosity. So we can then look at using different offset trays to try to improve that. Here's a plus three offset tray. And what you'll notice is better overhead elevation because we have less impingement then. And one of the next things we can think about is, well, let's try a plus six offset tray, maximum offset. We get the deltoid out of the way, reduce the shoulder, and now you can see significantly greater overhead elevation with that. So the offset trays, I think, have been a major advance in our ability to be able to do reverses. We'll go ahead, we'll put a little short stem in. You can see there, 55 millimeter stem, uncemented. And again, we've gone shorter and shorter on the stems on the primary. We don't have to force in a tight stem, so it's just some gentle taps. And then we'll be able to go ahead and place the tray on there, you can see. I tend to use E1 poly for my patients. This has about nine times less wear. You can see beautiful rolling motion. You can see there, so we get the patient's arm out to 80, 90 degrees, nice full overhead elevation. So this is just a typical example. And here's the post-operative x-ray with the bone-preserving base plate and then the offset tray for this patient. And this is a typical example of a reverse arthroplasty in my practice. So how about revision arthroplasty? We'll touch on this, a couple tips and tricks to be able to help you with this. So we know that removal of a humeral component can represent a significant challenge. Thankfully, these are the only two tools that you need to re revise well over 98% of the stems. It's a router bit and a square tip impactor. This is a trick I learned from our hip and knee colleagues. So I use the router bit circumferentially around the humerus, as you can see here. And then what we'll do is to take a square tip impactor from below, hit up on the stem, 
exactly as you can see here to remove the stem. And then we place a reverse arthroplasty in there. Here's a case of early glenoid loosening. So when you see early glenoid loosening, you need to think infection. And this is a stem that actually doesn't have a collar on it. So we have to think, how can we go ahead and remove this stem? And again, this is a really nice trick I learned from the hip and knee colleagues. I make my own collar. So what I do here is I'll take a helicoidal burr. We burr straight into the side of the implant, and then we make our own collar, and then we hit up with the square tip impactor. We push the eject button, and you can see the stem coming out like this. One of our former fellows, Jason Kang, looked these up for us. We can remove 98% of stems with this technique. Here's an example on the revision side. This was a patient sent to me, and we got a sense from these x-rays that the glenoid position was not quite right the way it was placed. So at the time of surgery, we went ahead, we did that router bit, square tip impactor, we removed this stem. You can see it was cemented above. And you could see, unfortunately, this surgeon placed the glenoid in sideways, not straight up and down. I subsequently revised the patient's other side. In both cases, the surgeon got confused and placed the glenoid component in 90 degrees the wrong direction. The other thing that the surgeon did is place the glenoid component way too high. The key in these cases is you have to identify the inferior part of the glenoid. You have to fall off the cliff. And what I like to use is that DARA retractor, pull down hard on the inferior capsule, and I release the inferior capsule off the inferior part of the glenoid. I actually don't like to dissect out the, radio, the axillary nerve. I like to know where it is and stay away. And in this case, you can see the glenoid component was placed very high. I was able to go lower. We placed a base plate in this patient and then went ahead and was able to convert this patient to a reverse arthroplasty. Here's another example. This is a patient who has an associated rotator cuff tear over time. You can see on the axillary view, you get the sense that there's some slight anterior translation of the humeral head. And that's usually a tip off that this patient has a tear of the subscapularis tendon and in this patient, we went ahead and at the time of surgery, revised it. So this is how I like to re remove a well-fixed glenoid component. So what we like to do is create a tic-tac-toe puzzle. We take a saw, it's about one centimeter wide. And what I like to do is make two horizontal cuts, two vertical cuts, as you can see here. So first the horizontal cuts, then the vertical cuts. And then I take a Ron Jordan, we remove those nine pieces. This is an example of a keeled component. We removed it. We'll go ahead and place the pin in there, and then we can ream the glenoid. If you want, you can use bone graft in there, or you can just go ahead and use an augmented glenoid component. This is one of the nice things we've learned over time. I think Dr. Sanchez Sotelo was one of the first folks to do this, and I think we've learned over time you can go from longer to shorter, meaning if I remove a 122 millimeter stem, I'll put an 83 millimeter stem in there. It gives me the ability to go from long to short, Eric Wagner, one of our former residents, published on this. So no need to bypass a stem to go longer. You can go shorter. How about humeral bone loss? This is something we're seeing more of. It can occur in cases of tumor, trauma, or revision arthroplasty. This was a case from one of our tumor colleagues that resected a malignancy from the proximal humerus. And you can see the large amount of humeral bone that's missing in this patient. So in this case, what we did, we did an APC reconstruction, and this is quite an affair. You have to get the graft, you have to match it up, and in this case, took a stem in there, cemented it, and this takes quite a while, and then unfortunately, nothing ruins results like follow-up. This patient came back one year post-operatively, and you can see the significant amount of humeral bone loss in this patient. This is another patient sent to me with humeral bone loss. This was a rancher's wife from South Dakota, a tough gal. She lived with this fracture for over a year. Her attitude was, if I don't get the job done, who will? So what she did is she windshield wipered away all this bone from the proximal humeral region. So challenging problem to take care of. And what we did for her, we made up for the missing bone with metal. So we've learned this lesson from our hip and knee colleagues who've done this for years. And in this case, what we did is we went ahead and placed the implant in there. And one of the other nice features, it comes with soft tissue reattachment sleeves. So I was able to find her subscapularis and I was able to sew that back. And there's the post-operative x-ray in this patient. 
Here's another example. This is sort of the final common pathway. This was a patient from Minneapolis who had a fracture. She had a pinning fail, plate fail, hemi fail, reverse fail, revision reverse fail. And what the surgeon did is he reamed away all her glenoid bone. So now her glenoid is basically base plate is against the scapular body and she's missing proximal humeral bone. So we need to make up for both, both at the time of surgery. So in this case, we did this cement within cement technique. Again, something we've learned from the hip and knee colleagues that I love. We can go ahead and do a cement within cement and we used a thicker glenosphere in this patient. Here's another example of someone who had a hemiarthroplasty for fracture. This is an example of one, again, the reason why we've gone away from hemiarthroplasty more towards reverse. The tuberosity is resorbed in this patient. So what we went ahead with this patient with significant humeral bone loss is we placed an implant in there to make up for the missing bone. And you can see with the proximal body on this implant, this results in lateralization and reestablishing that deltoid wrap which we want. Here's another example of a way to be able to manage humeral deficiency. This is a patient sent to me who had underwent a ORIF of a humeral fracture elsewhere. And again, these x-rays don't look quite right. And at the time of surgery, unfortunately, what we saw is that the surgeon fixed the humeral head facing backwards. So this is not going to work, obviously. So we went ahead and cut the humerus. I was able to find some of the associated rotator cuff, which we tagged, and then we went ahead and sewed down with this soft tissue sleeve, and you can see the post-operative x-ray. Lastly, a little bit about severe glenoid bone loss. So this was a patient that was sent to me, unfortunately, a patient with underlying glenoid dysplasia, underwent a reverse arthroplasty that failed and was infected, so we placed an antibiotic spacer in there when you look at a case like this, with this amount of severe glenoid bone loss, this is difficult to manage with uh, augments alone. So what we did in this case is we used a custom socket. So this is the vault reconstruction system. So this allows me to make a custom socket. One of the really nice things you can see on the right, all the screw trajectories and lengths are pre-planned. So we know exactly what we're going to be able to do at the time of surgery. And this is the view at the time. We placed the implant itself in there with all the screw trajectories and lengths ready to go for this patient. And that's what the post-operative x-ray looks like. You can see the implant there making up for the missing bone. So in summary, I think it's important to know the type of component to be removed. I think it's important to be prepared with a variety of grafts and implant sizes. Advanced imaging studies are extremely helpful in preoperative planning as well as component placement. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Very much appreciated. Thank you very much, Professor, for that fantastic presentation. And really very happy to see the kind of cases that you do at the Mayo Clinic. Just a few questions. Now, in one of the slides, you said that, I mean, that there was an inadvertent placement of the glenoid component in the medial lateral direction, right? So what is so, your... Uh, in one of your slides, you said that the glenoid component was placed in a medial lateral position rather than superior inferior. So that's a common scenario, right? Because the surgeon is probably uh, disoriented with yes. the position of the glenoid. So what does the uh, do you have any tips and tricks so that that uh, version is improved? It happens in the acetabulum as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's unfortunate. So I think the keys are the glenoid exposure to make sure you can see the glenoid fully. And the way that the key to that is the keys to glenoid exposure really are on the humeral side. So making sure that you do that aggressive head cut, remove the osteophytes, mobilize the deltoid and all the scar and do that inferior capsule release. That will give you the ability then to have a direct shot at the glenoid itself. And if you can't see the glenoid, go back to those four steps. That's the key. I think a lot of us now have gotten CT scans, but you don't necessarily need a CT scan. My mentor, Dr. Cofield, never got CTs. He understood the x-rays. He got perfect glenoid visualization. And really, that's all you need. Thank you very much, Professor. And uh, if you look at the complication rates, in, in the initial series of reverse shoulder, there were higher incidence of complications, say like 20%. Do you think the complications have 
come down drastically like uh, dislocation scapular notching all those complications have they come down yeah great great question so we just recently looked up our results here at the mayo clinic over 1000 reverses done by a variety of surgeons and our complication right now has come down dramatically the chance of needing another operation now is a one percent chance or less per year and a cumulative risk that adds up over time so i agree i think now with better techniques with better implants there's no doubt this has come a long way. I think the original results were alarming due to the high rate of complications, but I think over time, again, we've learned certain techniques that have helped significantly. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, the other scenario that reverse is commonly employed is in an acute proximal free, uh, humerus fracture. There's a tendency to go for a reverse straight away. Do you think that's the right trend? Because reverse is a really complex, I mean, it's uh, you should have a real solid training, right? So can we think about preserving the humeral head first and only it, in case it fails or in, in a non-union scenario, do we need to think about RUAS? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I would say that the first line of treatment for approximately humerus fracture is to go ahead and to try to fix it. No doubt about it. So if you're a younger patient, you have a three-part, even four-part, you should get it fixed. If you're elderly, though, and it's highly comminuted, I think the reverse itself is reasonable to do. I think the key is, is that the way people get into trouble are compounding errors. So again, making sure you put that glenoid base plate in neutral to 10 degrees of tilt, place the humeral stem in 30 degrees of retroversion, and then it's going to line up. The way people get into trouble are freehanding things, not using instrumentation, not using guides. So I'm a big believer in using guides and instrumentation. I like to get the tuberosity sewn back at the reverse if I can for fracture. Sometimes I, I'm unable to do that. I think it's also important to discuss with the patient preoperatively that they're unlikely to get the same outcome as someone who gets a reverse for osteoarthritis or rotator cuff arthropathy. It's just not the same predictability. And in your hands, which, is, which should be the ideal indication? It's the rotator cuff arthropathy itself? Yeah, I think rotator cuff arthropathy is, that's a home run. So if you do reverses for people with a massive rotator cuff tear, with or without arthritis and the inability to raise the arm, that's, that is a life changer for those patients. You take people who are like that and you're able to get them like that. And the other thing about it is the pain after a shoulder replacement, no doubt on average is less than a knee replacement. It's similar to a hip. So most of my patients now take minimal pain medication after arthroplasty. And for a reason that we don't understand that the pain after a reverse is actually less than an anatomic shoulder arthroplasty. So I think the reverse arthroplasty has come a long way as we've gone from cemented to uncemented stems and as the technology has improved. The other thing I would say for the surgeons that are watching, again, I agree you know, with exactly what you're saying. I think education in this way is critical. I have, watch videos. If you have a chance to take a course in the future, I think visiting surgeons that do a high volume of this but I think the learning curve on this, doing a reverse is actually pretty quick. So I think getting the glenoid exposure down after that, I think you'd be in great shape. Thank you very much, Prof. Just one last question before you wind up. What is the incidence of uh, propionibacterium infection in your series? There's a lot of uh, information that's coming out with QD bacterium, that is propionibacterium for shoulder surgery, especially arthroplasty. And how do you tackle it? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that no doubt the biggest risk factor for infection is the length of the procedure. So the longer that the wound is open and people are walking in and out of the OR, there's dust from the computer, that is the risk factor. So trying to do this surgery with a dedicated team in an efficient manner is the key. So this operation, it's interesting watching my own fellows and residents over time evolve. Once they get the technique down, they can do this from skin to subscap in about 30 minutes. So this operation can be very efficient. So I think it's practice, it's the team, and an efficient procedure is the key. And have you encountered this particular organism, QD bacteria? Absolutely. It's the most common organism we see that infects the shoulder. It's difficult to detect preoperatively. The testing, the blood work is not predictive. Aspirations many times are dry. But at the time of surgery, the cultures come back quite frequently for this. So most of my revisions, I tend to take everything out, clean it up, put new components in there. And if the cultures come back positive, then we treat them. One of the nice things at the Mayo Clinic now, 
that we're looking at more oral treatments rather than IV treatments postoperatively for people who have positive cultures. And in the revision scenario for an infection, do you believe that cement adds more value, antibiotic loaded cement? Yeah, I do if it's a chronic infection or if it's acute infection, if I can catch it quickly, I'll do an irrigation debridement, I'll remove the humeral tray, put a new one on there and treat them aggressively with antibiotics. I try to retain the component if it's acute, if it's chronic and they have a long-standing draining wound, I go to an open procedure. Thank you very much, Professor. I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Fantastic session, a lot of new information and new insight. I mean, this is going to be a presentation that's going to benefit thousands of people all over the world. Thank you very much, Professor, for joining in. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye -bye.